Should a teenager with a disability, an incurable and degenerative condition, have the right to choose to die? We are going to talk about the case involving an Appleton teenager who decided to stop using a ventilator that helped keep her alive and who passed away in late September. And the national reaction to this from disability rights groups and medical ethicists. I'm Joy Cardine. This is the Ideas Network of Wisconsin Public Radio. We are going to talk about um, a case involving an Appleton teenager who suffered from an incurable degenerative condition. And she chose to remove her ventilator, to stop using her ventilator, and wanted to die. She did pass away in late September, and there's been a lot of reaction to this case from disability rights groups and medical ethicists, and we thought we would talk about it this hour and wonder if you think a teenager should be able to make this decision it did the decision did have the mother's blessing but should a teenager uh, be able to make this decision 1-800-642-1234 or send an email to talk at wpr.org you can also post on the Joy Cardine show facebook page or tweet us at Joy Cardine show Carrie Ann Lucas is a child welfare law specialist and the founder and executive director of the organization Disabled parents rights good morning good morning thank you very much for being with us well Appleton teenager Jerrica Bolin suffered from spinal muscular atrophy type 2 she spent most of her time in a wheelchair uh, video stories uh, mentioned that she could you know, move her head a little bit and she could move her hands a little bit, but for the most part uh, couldn't move. This was an incurable uh, condition, uh, progressively was getting worse, and she chose to enter hospice and wanted to end her life, and and she did. What What is your um, overall reaction to this case? Well, I think one of the distinctions to make to begin with is that she did not use a ventilator. She she used a BiPAP, which is a much, first of all, it's a non-invasive form of breathing support. It's very similar to what people who have sleep apnea use. Hundreds of thousands of people around the country use CPAP and BiPAP machines to help with sleep apnea, which is the same machine that she used. So simply removing that device is not what caused her, is likely not what caused her death, given the amount of time it took for her to pass. Yeah. But yeah, I'm sorry about that, but I was just uh, re- recounting from the from the the news reports. We're calling it a ventilator, but you're saying it was a CPAP type machine, right? It's yeah. a BiPAP, so it's a bi level um, uh, breathing support. It's a support, absolutely, but does not do the breathing mm-hmm. for her. So, uh, and I'm a person, for example, who uses a ventilator. So if I didn't, if my ventilator was turned off, I would be dead within an hour. Oh, okay, yeah, because she did enter hospice at. I don't know, at the end of, uh, in, in the summer, and she didn't pass away until late September, so it, 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 was, not, uh, it was not imminent, that's for sure. The reports that I, had, that I saw were, had said 18 days, so what that indicates usually is that they withdrew, um, they withheld nutrition and, and water from her, and she probably starved to death under sedation. Yeah. So what is your, what is your, uh, your feeling about this? What is your reaction to this? Well, I think it's. I think it was in direct violation of controlling Wisconsin law to begin with. Um, controlling law in Wisconsin states that children do not have the ability to make the decision to withdraw medical care, and neither do their parents. Uh, in the absence of a child being in a persistent vegetative state, which which this young lady was not. Yeah. And and uh, how has the disabled community I- in general reacted to her decision? Uh, in, in large, with, uh, I think almost universally, with, with, uh, with, a, with great concern about it. There are, uh, there are some folks who believe that it was her decision, but the majority of the community and certainly every disability rights organization that took a position on the, on the issue was, was opposed to this, partly because of the precedent it set. Partly because this is a teenager who clearly had some some indications that her thinking wasn't very mature. 
this is this was a child who a few months before her death was posting on Facebook about her Beanie Baby collection and wanting more Beanie Babies for her collection, but also had some significant signs of disordered thought when she was describing her own condition and her wishes to die. Yeah, um, what do you mean, for example? Well, at one, on one interview, she was, and this is a televised interview, so you have her actual own words. She said that she first began thinking of dying after her first surgery when she was eight years old. And then another comment she made was that she never liked herself until she, be, until she decided to kill herself. So those are really problems. And when we see those types of thoughts in other adolescents, which is something I work in child welfare, we see these. We see teenagers who have these kinds of thoughts. And a teenager who doesn't have a disability receives intensive suicide prevention intervention. And, and this young woman did not. Jerrica did not, which is really what the tragedy is here. It's because of her disability and only because of her disability, she got different treatment. And that's discrimination. Well, she also uh, did garner worldwide attention uh, upon um, uh, an event that was held uh, prior to her entering hospice and and, um, and and stopping the use of the assist in her breathing. It, she had a, a prom. She wanted to go to prom, so they had a special uh, last dance event that the entire community of Appleton uh, and, and surrounding areas seemed to have turned out for. And uh, it seemed as though there was a great deal of support for her. And her decision did have, it appeared, her, her, her family's blessing. Does that make a difference? Well, I think it had certainly her mother's blessing. What is notably absent from any of the media coverage was her father or her father's family. So that's something that, that should be noted, is that there was never any mention in any of the media reports about her father. Yeah. My understanding is did not support the decision. Yeah. Um, but uh, we did also see videos uh, of her, uh, you know, describing how she could uh, she could speak, um, but uh, for the most part could only move her her head a little bit and her hands a little bit. Otherwise, she was, uh, you know, immobile because of of this uh, spinal muscular atrophy type two or SMA. You know, that's uh, and 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 we understand that at least I was I read that 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 is a you know, incurable and and can be progressive. Absolutely, but there are, there are there are thousands and thousands of us that have progressive neuromuscular diseases that are not suicidal. Most of us have. Uh, when when studies are done on on people with severe disabilities like this, the medical establishment often and Non-disabled people often rate our quality of life as very poor because they look at us, and, and I am speaking as a person with a severe neuromuscular disease myself. I'm also a quadriplegic as a result. They look at us and think that our quality of life must be very poor. But that's not, that's in fact not true. Of course, there are some people who rate their quality of life poor, some people who rate their quality of life absolutely fabulous and most people are somewhere in the middle and the numbers really line up absolutely on par with the rest of the population. People with spinal muscular atrophy tend to be quite intellectually bright. So this young woman really had a bright future in front of her. She should have gone to her high school prom as a junior or senior in high school. She should have gone to college. She should have had a career and a family. This is something that people with spinal muscular atrophy type 2 do day in and day out. People are doctors, they're lawyers, they're therapists, they're teachers, they're professors. People are very accomplished in their, in their professional field with this exact same condition, frankly, with a lot more severity than this young woman had. We're going to um, uh, we're going to take a short uh, short break, and then we will uh, take your calls with your your questions, your reactions, your views to the to the uh, case involving the Appleton teenager, fourteen year old Jerrica Bolin, who uh, passed away in late September uh, after entering hospice, uh, saying that uh, she wanted to die. 
1-800-642-1234 or send an email to talk at WPR.org. I'm Joy Cardine. This is the Ideas Network. I'm Joy Cardine. This is the Ideas Network of Wisconsin Public Radio. We're talking about whether or not a child with a disability has the right to choose to die. Our uh, conversation is uh, is prompted by the Wisconsin teenager, the Appleton teenager, Jerrica Bolin, who um, spent most of her time in a wheelchair. She suffered from spinal muscular atrophy type 2. She decided to end treatment. She died in late September, spurring a new round of the right to die debate. Our guest is talking about the, the rights of patients in disability cases like this, and we are welcoming your thoughts and questions and reactions. 1-800-642-1234 or send an email to talk at WPR.org. Carrie Ann Lucas is a child welfare law specialist and the founder and executive director of the organization Disabled Patients' Rights or Parents' Rights. Let's go to our first caller, Joelle in Menasha. Hi, Joelle. Hi, good morning. Morning. What do you think, Joelle? Well, I think that every human being is an individual and every experience is different. I understand that some people, you know, whether able bodied or not, when they have to live with a lot of extra care, like ventilators and breathing stuff aren't happy or okay with it and I think that they do have a right over their bodies and they're if they're um, able to go to therapy and still make this decision I think that people should be more supportive because we're not living in their skin and we're not experiencing what they're experiencing and so, yes, I believe, like, you know, everybody has the right to to that, to yeah, die yeah. with dignity yeah. if that's what they choose. And even a teenager, Joelle. I think if, if she went to therapy and somebody thought she was a sound mind and body to make that decision, I, I think so. Yeah. Because if she was suffering, if she felt like she was suffering, I don't think that's fair to to force someone to, to be somewhere where they don't want to be. Mm -hmm. uh, Carrie Ann. Well, I think the issue here is we're dealing with an adolescent who has the brain of an adolescent, who is making adolescent decisions. And, and we know that the brain in adolescence is not fully developed in order to make mature decisions. They really only think ahead a week or two, and they that's the worldview that teenagers have. And... When, when you look through that lens, and the problem here is it comes down to discrimination. If, if we're going to let children make these decisions, then it should be able to make children let children make these decisions regardless of disability. So we have to then be willing to say the depressed 14-year-old who broke up with her boyfriend who wants to die should get to die as well. Otherwise, it's disability discrimination because some children get intensive suicide prevention and other children don't. And it's based only on disability, and that's discrimination. And, and Carrie Ann, um, well, if uh, Jerrica were the age of eighteen, then uh, you wouldn't have any um, issue with this. I would still have concerns. On the other hand, the Supreme Court is clear that adults have the decision, have the ability to withdraw treatment. I think in this case, I think it would have been much less likely that she would have made this decision as an adult, um, just because of the way that she talked about her body, talked about the way that she thought she only liked herself at the time when she just decided to die, things like that are really signs of some disordered thinking. But had she gotten intensive therapy, had she gotten the kind of mental health treatment that we would provide to a non-disabled teenager who was asking to die in this way, I doubt she would have been there at 18. She would have had problems. She would have me. She would have gone to high school. This young woman never even went to high school. She would have gone to high school. She would have graduated from high school. She'd been looking forward to college. As a parent, I have a I have a teenager myself. I have a, a 17 year old who's also a quadriplegic who who has a different disability. But at 14, 
was in severe pain, who wanted to die. The response as a parent was to ensure that we did everything we could to address her pain issues, which were some of the exact same surgeries that Jerrica has had. And we're willing to do any intervention necessary to get her pain under control, but also intensive psychotherapy and mental health treatment to ensure that she didn't continue to have that worldview. Now she is a happy, almost 18-year-old in her senior year of high school and looking forward to work in her adult life. Yeah. In a video from the Appleton Post Crescent, uh, Jerrica Boland described her pain as a seven on her best days. Um, I mean, it, 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 I mean, I can't imagine that there hadn't been steps to try to control that pain, yet it still was a seven on her best days. Well, there were certainly some concerns with how her pain was being controlled based on her own reports. Based on what she said is that she would not take any medication until her pain was at least an 8 out of 10. That's his concern. Anybody who has chronic pain knows that what you do is you take medication early to treat the pain and get ahead of the pain. If she was being allowed to wait until her pain was at that level, that indicates, one, she doesn't have a lot of maturity to make decisions around her own body because she's not following standard medical recommendations. Or two, she wasn't getting good pain care. And having parented a child with chronic severe pain, I know what the protocols are, even in, even in adolescence. And as an adult with chronic pain, I know what the recommendations are for adults. And this young woman was not having pain managed in a good way in that way. And that's of concern because had her pain been better managed, she might not have been in this position. So I'm not sure that she got to good specialists. Uh, and, that, and that's a problem. There are specialists and she may have had to travel to get to them. But we know that she traveled because there were news reports about her traveling and, and visiting relatives in other states. So she could have gone to places like Chicago where I believe her father lived and, and seen specialists there who really do specialize in this condition. And it's not clear that she did get that help. Um, Marks on Facebook says, I totally support her, uh, Jerrica. Why force someone with a uh, definite fatal prognosis to endure suffering we can't imagine for our own comfort? We often forget how mature and intelligent teenagers can be, especially when it comes to to their autonomy and when they've gone through things like this. Uh, that brings up the word suffering again. Our caller also said when someone is suffering, they should have uh, the right to do this. Um, I mean, you mentioned, uh, you know, we we should allow the, you know, if, if we allow this in the a situation of uh, Jerrica Bolin to uh, take her, uh, choose to die, that we should allow the 14-year-old who broke up with her boyfriend, um, you know, the, the right to choose to die. They're not exactly the same thing, though. That, that, that girlfriend, you know, isn't isn't in pain, isn't uh, practically immobile. Um, what about that? I think it's a, a misperception of our lives as disabled people. And those of us in the disability community are living with the exact same or very similar conditions saying, this is a problem. This is a problem with her perception on life because we, the fact that somebody has a disability does not mean they're suffering. The fact that someone has paralysis does not mean they're suffering. And it's a very ableist point of view from non-disabled people to say, oh, you must be suffering because you have a disability, when that's not true. And she did not need to be suffering. And so we talked about some about her pain control. But it's also a misperception to say, well, just because somebody has a disability, they're more mature. And that's not accurate either. Teenagers are still teenagers, whether or not they have a disability. There might be more experience with particular medical conditions, but it doesn't mean that the child is more mature just because they have a disability. That is a common misperception of disabled children, but it's absolutely a misperception. This is a little girl who a few months before her death was collecting Beanie Babies and posting on Facebook about her Beanie Baby collection. That's not an overly mature, that's a 14-year-old, that's a middle schooler, and that's a, frankly a very 
typical middle schooler. So I think it's I think it's it's enforcing this idea that oh it's okay for disabled children to die when when it's really not. We're talking about a death of a child simply because she had a disability. Yeah. What, well, so what actions do you think should be taken when a teenager uh, with a disability uh, wants to make this decision to st- stop treatment and, and to die? I, I think, first of all, that it should not be allowed to happen. That's, that's clearly what Wisconsin law says, is that should not be allowed to happen. And if the parents persist in allowing that to happen, then there has to be state intervention, just like there would be for any other child who's experiencing medical neglect. And that's something that the state does step in and address on a regular basis. So that, that is the point of the child welfare system. doesn't mean a kid goes to foster care, but it means that there needs to be another set of eyes looking at the situation. There should, she should have the right to have legal counsel and have a guardian ad litem appointed to represent her best interests. She should have the right, her mother should have due process rights in front of a court. But ultimately, it could be up to a judge if somebody is not making good decisions on behalf of their child and, this, and acting outside the law, which is what happened here. We are talking with uh, Carrie Ann Lucas, a child w- welfare law specialist, founder, and executive director of the organization Disabled Parents' Rights about uh, whether a disabled child has the right to choose to die. She says that Wisconsin law says no, and um, that she says most uh, disabled uh, rights groups are are concerned over the uh, case involving the 14-year-old Wisconsin teenager, Jerrica Bolin, who was suffering from spinal muscular atrophy type 2, who decided to end treatment and who died in late September. Back to our conversation about uh, a uh, child with disabilities and whether or not that child has the right to die or to choose to die. I'm Joy Cardin. This is the Ideas Network. This is the Ideas Network of Wisconsin Public Radio. We are talking with Carrie Ann Lucas, who is a child welfare law specialist and the founder and executive director of the Organized Disabled Parents' Right Group. And we are welcoming your thoughts and questions and reactions to the death of a disabled Appleton a teenager. We're talking about uh, this case involving a 14-year-old Appleton teenager who decided to end treatment and who passed away in late September. Talking about the national reaction to that from disability rights groups and medical ethicists, and we're wondering what you think and what questions you have. Do you think that 14-year-old Jerrica Bolin, who suffered from spinal muscular atrophy type 2 and spent most of her time in a wheelchair, uh, should, should have been able to choose to enter hospice and choose to end treatment and end her life? Let's go to Jeremy and Racine next. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, thanks for my call. I have a question. If the state intervened, what would have state would have done differently than what was already being done for the child and her doctors and her mother? From what I understand, her mother was a nurse, but she was in a medical field, so it's just one of those things. What would the state have done? And the other question I have, where is the line drawn between an individual's right to live the life they want to and where the state has the right to start intervening. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, mother's knows best type thing. Uh, we don't trust you that you know what's best for you, so we're going to step in and decide for you. It's, it's a very slippery slope, and, and where does it end? And uh, that's it. I'll take my answers up here. Mm-hmm. Carry on. Well, I think on a, on a couple of issues, had the state intervened, First of all, her father would have been notified. He would have had an opportunity to participate in any decisions. So that's something that always happens if a child welfare case opens is that all all the parents get to be involved. So both parents for for each child if there's multiple children on a case. Um, The state could have ensured that she had gotten appropriate psychiatric care. The state could have ensured she was getting appropriate medical care getting to other specialists if need be, getting second or third opinions if need be. 
Those are all things that a court could order to ensure that happened. And a court could order and say, no, she can't enter hospice. Those are things that the court could do. I, we absolutely did not advocate this, that this child should be removed from her mother's care because it did appear, other than making, other than signing consent for her to end her life, the mother was providing otherwise good care. But so those are things the state could have done. It was absolutely a slippery slope, and, and, and I would argue it goes in the opposite direction because this is we are seeing the slippery slope before that it has always been only adults could make this decision. Now, in this case, the state of Wisconsin allowed a child to make this decision, something that's not been allowed before in this type of circumstance, where a child could affirmatively remove treatment, a child who was not dying. And this is not a condition that would have resulted in death for decades. That spinal muscu- People with spinal muscular atrophy type 2 live into, their, into late adulthood. Uh, and a minimum. some people live into their 60s and 70s uh, and beyond, but most people live into at least late adulthood. So this is not something that she was imminently dying. This is not a child who is, who is facing death. So in, given that circumstance, it, it's really problematic. And it certainly sends a message to other children who teenagers, being a middle schooler is a difficult time. In any middle schooler's life, it's a horrible, it's a, being 14 is awful. It's awful for all, almost everybody. And if it wasn't awful, it was generally, those are the people who were making it awful for the, for the others. So this is not a time where we want children to be making life and death decisions because their, their point of view is, is not good. We know that kids this age really, really struggle. They struggle because their hormones are, are changing. Their bodies are changing. Their brain is developing and changing, and they're really learning to navigate the world with, with some more autonomy. But also having that safe, that safety net of having family and community around them. Imagine what would happen if the community in Appleton, instead of cheering on this girl's death, had said, no, we want you to live. Because odds are the family would not have raised $36,000. Had they said, we need help to help our daughter live. It only happened because there was a pitiful story of a child wanting to die, wanting her last death. A child who was not near death. Why, why do you suppose the state did not step in if, if, if this is clearly against uh, state law? I don't know that it's clear that they didn't try. And that's something we don't know. Child welfare cases are confidential. But my understanding is the family went to another county to enter hospice, and that may have been an attempt to evade child protection. I don't know. I know that certainly um, I've heard stories from family members saying that that was a concern on their part. I, I have heard from family members that they believe child welfare was intervening and so that they were looking forward to having that happen and being able to, to have their input that way. So it's possible the local county tried to intervene, but if they cross county lines, there would need to be a new referral in the new county in order mm-hmm. to initiate actions in many states. Let me have you respond to Whitney on Facebook who says, a person choosing to die doesn't devalue the life of disabled people. If we want to value the lives of disabled people, we need to recognize their right to self-determination. What's your response to that? People have the right to self-determination. The issue is, is we don't let other children die. Any other child who would who didn't have a disability would not be allowed to die. But for her disability, she was allowed to enter hospice and have food and and hydration withheld for 18 days to cause her death. We would not allow that to happen to any other child. And it's only because she has a disability that it's somehow acceptable. And I go back to the issue of the notion that if it's okay for people to have autonomy, then we have to be okay with having the, the child who is suicidal because she broke up with her boyfriend, who the pain in that moment is also very real and very excruciating to that child. We have to be okay with that decision, and I don't think we are. If we are, then that's, 
then the society needs to make that decision on the whole. Either it's okay for everybody or it's not okay. It's either one or the other. But we should not be saying it's okay for a disabled teenager to die because people who don't have disabilities have an imagination of what quality of life are, should be like for a disabled person and that it's poor because they can't imagine in their own heads what it'd be like to live with a disability. When in fact, those of us living with a disability, with the same disability are telling you, no, it's really not bad. There's something else going on here because we have that lived experience. We know that. Yeah. And we I, are the experts in this. And I want to thank you, um, uh, uh, Carrie Ann, for being with us. Carrie Ann Lucas is a child welfare law specialist, founder and executive director of the organization Disabled Parents Rights.